For thousands of years, the city of Naples has been the destination for many goods and travelers from across the world, as well as the last point of departure for thousands of migrants leaving their homes in order to find a better life across the seas. However, in the last weeks of March 1938, the city was swarmed by the Italian police, as well as the forces of the Vatican, in their search for a man who had seemingly boarded a ship only to then disappear into thin air, never to be heard from again. Decades earlier, in 1906, Ettore Majorana was born in Catania, on the Italian island of Sicily, to a wealthy and prominent family of Italian politicians and academics. The leader of the family was Ettore's grandfather, Salvatore, who was a professor of political economy at the University of Catania and a senator in the Kingdom of Italy. He even rose to become a minister of agriculture, industry, and commerce under Victor Emmanuel II, who was the first king of a modern, unified Italy. Salvatore had very high standards for his family, with three of his sons following in his footsteps by joining him at the university and becoming more engaged in politics, while the two remaining sons chose to pursue very different career paths. Querino studied theoretical physics, eventually becoming a professor in Bologna, while the youngest son, Fabio, studied engineering and became the director of the first telephone company in Catania, leading him to grow the family's wealth significantly, owning several homes and properties across Italy by the time his son, Ettore, was born. And even though, or maybe because he grew up in this high-achieving environment, Ettore was recognized as being one of the most intelligent members of the family, even as a small child, with his family noting that he was able to do complex mathematics in his head and he was seen as being a very good chess player, even from a young age. However, while being extremely talented, he was also known to be very shy and sensitive to criticism when it came to strangers. Wishing to foster their son's education, his parents moved the family and their servants from their home in Catania to another one of their homes in Rome in order for Ettore to attend an exclusive Jesuit school in the city. He then took a two-year prep course in order to get him ready for the University of Rome before eventually starting to study in the Department of Engineering with Ettore hoping to follow in his father's footsteps by becoming an engineer. However, that all changed when he met a fellow student named Emilio Segre. Segre, seeing Ettore's mathematical ability and his talent at solving theoretical problems, pushed him to become a physicist. Segre himself had started off in engineering before switching to physics in order to study under Enrico Fermi, who had recently been made the chair of the physics department in Rome, even though he was only 24 years old. Ettore was also probably familiar with Fermi, because his uncle, Quinorio, was one of the judges on the competition that awarded Fermi the professorship. Ettore then joined Segre in the physics department, and they soon became part of a group of young Italian scientists led by Fermi, most of whom were still in their mid-twenties, known as the Via Penisperna Boys, who helped to make several breakthroughs in physics. During this time, Ettore's talents began to shine, with Segre knowing that his mathematical abilities even surpassed those of Fermi's. When one day, after Fermi had shared some of the math he had spent several weeks working on for a 1927 paper, Ettore, wishing to double check the math, went home that night, reworked the equations in his head, and presented Fermi with the new calculations the next day, congratulating him on their accuracy. Fermi soon became Ettore's thesis advisor, and his senior paper was later accepted with distinction by the university in 1929. A few years later, in 1932, Ettore was also awarded with a teaching degree in theoretical physics with a full recommendation of Fermi. During this time, Ettore began collaborating with more physicists, offering his insights into their work, and publishing several more papers on his own. In 1933, he won a grant, and he used it to travel first to Leipzig to meet with Werner Heisenberg, who had just won the Nobel Prize in Physics, as well as with Heisenberg's doctoral students, Rudolf Peierls and Felix Bloch. During this time, he is also known to have fallen ill with a stomach infection, but he was able to recover and soon left Germany in the summer. He continued on to Denmark and met with Niels Bohr, who had won the Nobel Prize a decade earlier in 1922. Ettore then went back to Germany for a short while, before returning to Italy in the fall. And when he returned, he stopped publishing any new research, with Segre noting that during this time, Ettore, who was already known to often work by himself, began to become even more reclusive. By 1935, he would hardly even leave his house, even to come to the university. Several people have assumed that this was a result of the illness Ettore experienced while traveling in Germany, along with exhaustion from having to constantly put out papers, with many people proposing that this was just a result of him overworking himself and eventually just burning out. However, the Majorana family had also experienced a tragedy during this time, with Ettore's father, Fabio, falling ill in 1933 and eventually passing away in 1934. This was devastating for the entire family, but especially for Ettore, who was known to be extremely close with his father. 
And despite not publishing any more work publicly, Etre still remained in close contact with other physicists, including Segre, Fermi, as well as with his uncle Quinorio, and he would often help them by reviewing their work and offering new insights. With Segre noting that whenever Fermi traveled abroad, he would correspond with Etre the most, as he felt that his insights were the most valuable. It also appears as though during this time, while Etere was still conducting his own research and providing important feedback to other scientists, he began to refuse any credit for the advice he offered them, as revealed in a letter sent to Etere from his uncle Quinorio. I wanted to ask you one more thing. In the development of this research, I often made use of your help. Even last year, you did not allow me to quote your name. On the other hand, I think that in a full description of the observed phenomena, it is useful to give a picture of some of your suggestions. Thus I ask you, do you think this can be considered appropriate by the readers? Do you persist in denying me the pleasure of quoting your name? And do you behave like this because of your modesty, or because of the simplicity of the topic under examination? There are also several other instances of Fermi and Segre coming across some of the work Etere was working on and urging him to publish it, but to no avail leading several of these discoveries that Etre helped to discover to be solely credited to other people, or go undocumented until another researcher came across it independently, several months or even years later. And then in 1937, a contest was announced for three new professor of physics positions in Italy, with Fermi chairing the committee to choose the top three candidates. However, even though Fermi pushed Etre to enter the competition, and even helped him publish a new paper that same year, Etre didn't end up in the final three. This is assumed to be the result of the third place candidate, Giovanni Gentili Jr., who was a noted physicist in his own right, but he was also the son of Giovanni Gentili Sr., a powerful politician and philosopher who had helped to develop the doctrine of fascism with Benito Mussolini, and it's assumed that since he was worried that Etre's talent might push his son out of the running, he used his influence to have his son chosen instead. Therefore, in order to compensate for this, Etre was awarded with a separate professorship at the University of Naples, which he accepted. Soon after he moved into the city, he took up residence in the upscale Hotel Bologna, and as Etre began to teach in January of 1938, already being financially well off and not really needing the money, he let his paychecks build up in his bank account for the next couple months. Until March 23rd, when he suddenly withdrew all his savings and got on a boat from Naples to Palermo. Two days later, Antonio Carelli, a fellow physicist at the University of Naples received a note from Palermo, allegedly from Majorana, stating, Dear Corelli, I made a decision that has become unavoidable. There is in a bit of selfishness in it, but I realize what trouble my sudden disappearance will cause you and the students. For this as well, I beg your forgiveness, but especially for the betrayal of your trust. The sincere friendship and sympathy you have gave me over the past months, I ask you to remind me of all those I learned to know and appreciate in your institute especially Scuti. I'll keep a fond memory of them all, at least until 11pm tonight, possibly later too. E. Mayorana. And the next day, another note had arrived. Dear Corelli, I hope you got my telegram and my letter at the same time. The sea rejected me, and I'll be back tomorrow at the Hotel Bologna, traveling perhaps with this letter. However, I have the intention of giving up teaching. Don't think I'm like an Ibsen heroine, because the case is different. I'm at your disposal for further details. E. Mayorana. With an Ibsen heroine probably being a reference to the famous Norwegian writer Henrik Ibsen and his work A Doll's House, where the main character Nora, at the conclusion of the play, feeling betrayed by her husband, walks out on her family and their children. Corelli, alarmed by these notes, reached out to the Mayorana family to make sure he was okay. The family then sent Ettore's brother Luciano to Naples to check in on him, but when he got there, he found Ettore's room at the Hotel Bologna to be empty. And when the local authorities began their search for Etre, they soon determined that he had taken the boat back to Naples, sharing a cabin with the professor from the University of Palermo, but there's no record of him ever getting off the boat. When the news got back to the Mayorana family, taking matters into their own hands, they immediately began petitioning the police, government, and even Mussolini himself in order to intensify the search for Etre. Oftentimes, when this story has been told in the past, there have been assumptions that Etere may have been banished by the authorities due to his work as a physicist and his political beliefs. However, when looking into the records, a more complex picture begins to emerge. Etere, coming from a deeply Catholic and well-established Italian political family, was in many ways in line with, and even sympathetic to, the conservative beliefs of Mussolini's Italy during this time, with Etere even espousing several anti-Semitic views despite having grown up with several Jewish friends and colleagues. This would include his childhood friend Emilio Segere, his German colleague, Felix Bloch, as well as Lala Chapon, who had met and married Enrico Fermi in the 1920s, and was a mother to their two children. 
In fact, due to the Mayorana's close ties to the government, it appears as though there was extra attention given to the disappearance of Ettore. The same week Ettore went missing, his uncle, Olivero Savini Nietzsche, a state counselor, was able to pressure the police department in Rome into allowing him to have a personal meeting with the head of police. During this meeting, he was able to outline a detailed description of Ettore to the authorities. This pressure then resulted in the police sending out a national telegram to all local police commanders across the country, asking them to keep a lookout for Ettore, and his name was even added to the frontier list. This was a document found at all Italian border crossings, letting officials know that anyone with the name Mayorana was not allowed to cross the border. Ettore's mother was even able to petition Mussolini to promote the search for him. Enrico Fermi would also send a petition to Mussolini, However, Fermini's family would flee soon afterwards, first to Sweden, where he would accept the Nobel Prize for Physics, before eventually settling in America. This was due to Mussolini's government passing a series of anti-Semitic laws that targeted Italian Jews, including Fermi's wife. This stripped them of their professorships at universities, their jobs in government offices, and eventually their Italian citizenship. Emilio Segre would also leave for the US soon afterwards, for the same reasons. Back in Italy, several nationwide notices were sent out repeatedly in the following months, notifying police officers across the nation to ramp up their search for Ettore, and continuous announcements would be made until March of the next year, with the Mayorana family even establishing a reward of 30,000 lira for anyone who could help track him down. The family was also concerned that Ettore might have had a crisis of faith and entered a Catholic convent, so they petitioned the Vatican, who were able to organize a search of all the convents in Naples, as well as the surrounding regions. The search soon expanded to cover several monastic orders across the central, southern, and northern parts of Italy, with the search soon covering the entire country in the following months. However, even with thousands of searchers from the church and the police looking for him, as the weeks turned into months, no record of Ettore could be found. Over a year later, in September of 1939, a notice was published at the University of Naples, announcing that Ettore's position at the university was now officially empty. No one ever saw or heard from Ettore again after this point, and besides the occasional rumor that he somehow managed to live out the rest of his life in South America, few members of the public would even remember him. But several of his colleagues in the world of physics would continue to reflect on his work and his potential in the decades to come, especially as many of those who had fled to the US ended up working on the Manhattan Project together during the Second World War, and they would often reminisce about Ettore and hope that he would return one day to help them with their work. A few years later, his colleague, Felix Bloch, would go on to win the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1952, and Emilio Segere, Mayorana's oldest friend, would win it in 1959. Thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you next time. And thanks to my patrons, Ontroid, and DC, who is the first person to join the Prime Minister level for my Patreon.